Hello, and welcome to the first ever episode of Triple F Shooting. Today, we are going to be reviewing the Cimarron Number no. 3 First Model American. Before we get into this thing too far, we'll do the safety check and the cool part. No bullets. Gun literally looks broken in half. Neato gang. All sorts of fun. So, the Cimarron number no. 3 came out somewhere around the end of 2020, uh, and that's when I picked mine up. When I first purchased it, it was around $900. We are currently videoing in August of 2022, and this thing has gone up to around $1,300, at least according to the manufacturer. You can definitely get it for cheaper than that if you look around a little bit. Uh, sometimes you can find them on Gunbroker for still around $900, which is pretty cool. My particular sample is chambered in 45 Colt. I chose that because I reload for it. I've got all this crap behind me. If you can't tell, I reload a few different things. And I can manufacture quite a bit of that ammo for this piece. I could not do that with an original due to the caliber. So very cool to me that I can have a piece of history that I can shoot in a modern-ish caliber. They also offer the thing in 44-40, 44 Russian, and 44 Special. So you have a few different choices if 45 Colt's not really your thing. The thing is also offered in two different barrel lengths. This is the 8 inch, which is what it was originally designed in. So historically speaking, I chose this. I think it's a little bit cooler, at least just to have as close to the original as possible. You can also get it in somewhere around this for a 5 inch barrel length, which would suit you if you did some cowboy action shooting, wanted it to be a little bit faster out of the holster. Um, not exactly the gun I'd use for quick draw though. So I chose that eight inch again for the history of it. So this thing is absolutely gorgeous. So I'm gonna bring you in. We're gonna snuggle up nice and tight and take a look at this thing up close. All right guys, so I'll try not to scream in your ear from up close here, but as you can see, the bluing on this thing is really nice. It's very shiny, uh, well finished. There are no shallow spots. There's a ton of fingerprint oil for me handling the thing, but very good looking gun with no real issue in the bluing or the finish. I do have some very nice looking case hardened sections on the hammer, the trigger guard, part of the extraction mechanism here, all the way through the hinge. My front sight sort of looks like that. It's kind of a brownish gray, but definitely case hardened. And then my grip latch on top there. Um, one of the cool things about this revolver is that it has a lot of the same historical markings. So I'll throw in a couple pictures because it'll be a lot easier to focus. But on the top strap here, you have all the patent dates that this gun would have had originally, dating back into the 1860s, which is very neat. You have a U.S. marking, and then we end up with that being about the end of the similarities there. You do have a serial number in the same place, and I have 45 Colt stamped on the side of the gun there. Now, the originals did not have any kind of name stamping for the caliber or anything like that, so this is a little bit different. Again, it's a clone, it's not exact. Uh, I also have my Italian proof markings and my Uberti made in Italy marking. They do a really good job of hiding that away on the bottom of the gun. Uh, one other thing that I really like and I don't want to forget is that the wood grips on this thing are not finished in any kind of lacquer or anything like that. They're just kind of a raw feeling wood, um, kind of a nice walnut look I would suppose I am by no means a carpenter or anything like that but I really like the fact that those aren't finished it gives you a much better grip um, and it's not quite so slick as a lot of the other clones are okay now that we're all unsnuggled and everything we can get into the history of the revolver so while we were doing the close-up I talked about it being a clone and having some similarities in the markings and things like that this revolver from Cimarron is a clone of a Smith & Wesson number no. 3 first model. So a lot of the name and everything that Cimarron uses is pretty much the same. The Smith & Wesson first model was the first successful large bore revolver for those guys. Uh, it was chambered in 44 American. 
that was not an extremely powerful round. Uh, you had something weighing about 205 to 210 grain going, I believe, somewhere under 700 feet per second. So not exactly a powerhouse, but it was much better than the two models before this one. The Smith & Wesson number one and number two. The number two, I believe, had some other chamberings, but the number one especially was chambered in 22 short. If you've ever fired a 22 long rifle, you know it's not exactly a stopping round. And that thing was in black powder and even smaller than your 22 long rifle. The really cool thing, kind of fun fact for anybody that's into history, there are actually pictures out there of Civil War soldiers holding up Smith & Wesson number ones as a backup gun because in that time you had a cartridge revolver all the way back in the 1860s that held seven rounds. So even though it wasn't, it's not exactly like by today's standards huge, you had something that had seven rounds that were fairly well protected from the elements that you pretty much knew they were going to go bang if you needed it. Pretty cool when your other option is a muzzle-loading musket. So something to keep in mind there. Now, back to the 44 American round that this thing was chambered in originally. That was also a heel-type bullet, very similar to, again, that 22 long rifle. So that means you have a shank going down into the brass, and the diameter of the bullet is the same diameter as your brass. That doesn't sound necessarily terrible, but it's much more difficult to load, and it also leaves you with an exposed lube ring sticking out of your brass, meaning that lube is going to pick up lint, dirt, whatever you're storing that round in before it goes into the gun, potentially sending that down the barrel, which is a problem. Um, that 44 American did gain some traction, and this gun also did, with the Russians. The Russians didn't necessarily like that heel-type bullet, so they developed the 44 Russian caliber. Uh, most people consider that an extremely accurate round. And that thing turned into the 44 Special, which turned into the 44 Magnum that we know and use today. So kind of neat to have a piece of history that sort of led into a caliber that we use regularly today. Um, the other really interesting thing about this, when we were talking about those markings, you have that U.S. mark. That means that at least the original one that this was cloned from was in military service. Not many people are going to see these because there were only a thousand of them that made it into military service. Mike Harvey, the owner of Cimarron Firearms, has one of those, and that is why this one has a U.S. marking. He took his original Smith & Wesson number one U.S. marked over to Italy with him so that they could go from the tip of the barrel to the butt of the grip and get as close as they possibly could. So very, very cool, historically speaking. Uh, being that this had a little bit of military service, it developed into what most people are going to be aware of with the top break, and that is the Schofield, which we have right here. Not a ton of differences, but some things that make it a little bit easier to handle. As you may have noticed, I use one hand to run the latch to open it. Don't want to give this one too much air time because that's not the focus of the video. Lots of people have already seen that. Not many people pay attention to this one. So that's what we're going to stick with. Uh, the only other things that we want to talk about, historically speaking, that differ from the clone, because this is in a modern caliber, you do have a longer cylinder, you have a beefier barrel, and I don't know if it is or not, I believe the extraction system and this lug are a little bit chunkier than they would have been on the original. But otherwise, that gives us pretty much as close as you can possibly get to something that was made in 1870 without paying $4,000. So very, very cool. Now, because this thing was designed in the late 1860s, coming out around 1870, you end up with a little bit of quirky handling. So we're going to get into that. Okay, so now that we're back from the range, uh, let's talk a little bit about the handling of the firearm. So again, real quick, nothing in it. Yay, everyone's safe. Uh, 
One of the big things about this gun, if you are used to handling or if you like any other kind of Western firearms, most of what you're going to see is a Colt single action style of pistol. Those feel awesome in hand. Most of the weight is balanced out pretty well. They point really well. All that is super. This is not that gun. So because of our extractor lug, our long barrel, our tilting mechanism and all that good stuff, this gun ends up being fairly nose heavy. Uh, it tends to feel like it's wanting to tip out of the hand. It is nothing that causes you not to be able to shoot it very well. Uh, in fact, in running this thing, I thought there would be a lot of issues compared to that Colt single action style. And I like this just as much, but it is very different. Uh, with that front weight, as you are running the action, it tends to tip forward. I'm not sure how well that's going to show up in the shooting video, but it does. It feels like it's sort of tipping away from you each time you go at it. Also, because of the geometry of this angle, so we're fairly straight up and down back here with a sharp curve, I have to ride the gun really, really high. Uh, at least high enough that it feels like I'm not really hanging on to a whole lot of grip. Not a very large grip. I don't have huge hands. You can see that I take up most of that grip with my hand. I don't have very much width here, but I have long, longer fingers. So just to reach the action, I've got to come up way high. That also means that if you can see how my fingers going across the trigger guard there, I'm coming in at a fairly steep angle, meaning that I'm actually interacting with the trigger really high up, losing a lot of that leverage that you get down here. Um, doesn't seem to cause anything serious, but this trigger pull does feel a hair heavier to me than a Colt clone. With that high ride, that does allow me to get up on the hammer a little better. And it actually keeps the recoil really tame. 45 Colt is no powerhouse by any stretch, uh, especially loaded with trail boss. Uh, but as with modern shooting, the higher up on the grip I can get, the less recoil leverage that that gun's going to have on me. So kind of cool there. Let's me get pretty much if I wanted to, I get all the way up into the hammer, which that would actually be difficult to run, but possible. One major thing about the original design of this gun compared to other things is that the sights are sort of awful. It's awesome that they're awful, and we'll throw a pick in here so you can kind of see what that looks like. But to me, it's like having floating toothpicks. At least these two are attached, but you sort of have this toothpick look where I have two stubs or two posts coming straight up off the gun, off of like a flat table, and then I have my front half moon which is also from the shooter's view just another post so you're sort of aligning all of this up on top of a table whereas with a colt style firearm the body of the gun comes up and then a gutter is cut into it so you kind of have a shape that your eye can follow and then you're just putting a blade into it so it feels a little more intuitive uh, didn't really notice a huge difference it's just it's so different when you're looking at it because no other gun does that that you it's just sort of jarring at first uh, you still run the gun really well though. So kind of odd, but again, awesome because it comes from the late 1860s, early 1870, and people just did things differently because there weren't a ton of examples to copy out there. The place that this gun shines is the loading and unloading. So one of the major reasons that the army thought it was something neat is because you could get all the rounds out at the same time. You can see the extractor star comes up there on my ratchet system. So it gets right about there and then starts to fire. Now, if I go ahead and really crank on this thing, you can actually send the rounds flying into the air. Now, when cranking that revolver open really hard, you can see that all those rounds come out very quickly, which is a huge contrast to a Colt single action where I am individually punching rounds out with an extraction rod. This thing can get empty in a hurry. It can also be reloaded fairly easily because I have a nice view of the entire thing. I can grab it left or right hand, whichever you prefer or is your dominant. You can see all of the open chambers and then from my belt, I can just start throwing rounds in there.
Now, one thing about 45 Colts, so a more modern or at least a lasting round in this older style gun that it was never chambered for, is that 45 Colt has a very small rim and you can actually create malfunctions because of it. So I do have some empty brass here. Essentially what happens is the rim is so small that when sitting on that extractor star, it can fall down or be missed entirely if you really crank the thing open. So what you're left with is the brass falls below the extractor, sits here, and when that extractor goes home, it's resting on top of it, meaning when you go to close the gun, if you don't notice it, we stop somewhere about here and can't go anywhere, your extractor's in the way. That is not something you would have run into with an original, at least I wouldn't imagine, just because it was chambered for 44 American. 45 Colt was never really intended to be extracted based on the lip of the case here. It was intended to be extracted through that rod, punching from the inside out. So that's just a modern oddity. I'm not sure that it would do this in 4440 or 44 Russian or anything else. I think that's solely a 45 Colt problem, but that pretty much handles all of the tabletop stuff that we're going to talk about. So let's take this thing out to the range and put it through a few paces on the clock. Had to miss one, right? <laughs> All right, guys, we're out here at the range in our 1880s tactical gear. Got my really cool handmade holster. I've got my ammo, my period correct shot timer, and I have a whole bunch of targets behind me. So the first thing that we're going to try out is basically to see how well does this thing come out of the holster and onto target. So we're going to be testing a few things. The pointability of the revolver, how well does it come up in the hand and get on target, and then basically the action, how well can I run that action and get it hit fairly quickly. So all I'm going to do is set this to a random beep, it'll go off, I will draw and fire one round, check the time, and we'll do that five times. I lied. We're going to do a random beep now. Ta-da! Going for the center target. We won. That took a whopping 218. That's fairly gross. Try that again. One seventy seven. One ninety two. I'm apparently getting slower. Last one. Two forty four because I flubbed on my draw. So the sights were actually a little bit easier to get on than I thought they would be. Again, gun is still stiff. Get those rounds out. Uh, wasn't too bad. I had a couple of, we're shooting cold. I didn't really do any warm-ups. And gun's coming up. It's a little ungainly in the draw. Very long barrel. If I was doing any kind of quick shooting, I would definitely go for the five inch barrel, but not as bad as I thought it would be. So for the next thing we're gonna do, is I'm just gonna pick a couple targets and try to go at them at the same time. So I will draw, I have two targets. I've got two bandits coming after my mine cart. And I will see how long it takes me to transition from target to target. Again, testing that point ability and also testing our action and how well those sights, which are like floating toothpicks, will transition from one target to the next. Again, with my period correct timer here. Again, random start. To make it more fun, I'm gonna go for the far left target and for the far right target. So 327 on my first go. I'm gonna do that two more times. A little 
butter, 289. Now I do need to reload because I'm only loading five shots. The reason I'm only loading five shots is because like we talked in the tabletop, my hammer goes all the way through to the firing pin and could potentially become a problem if I were to drop the gun or anything like that. So I load five, go to an empty chamber like that, cock the gun, drop the hammer. Now I'm loaded and safe so that when I draw the gun and cock it, I can get a hit, hopefully. So last time. That's a 293. Again, not as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, gun handled pretty well. The sights actually track much better than I thought they would. Uh, not really anything terrible to say there. The last thing I want to do with it is a reload drill. So I'm going to draw the gun, fire a shot, reload, see how long that takes, come back up, fire one more shot. So I'm going to get my gun squared away. Get these two empties out. <gasps> I've induced the malfunction. So if you can come Okay, so we had that malfunction. I'm going to get a little bit closer up so you can actually tell what's going on. You can see it almost just fell off if you look really close. But if I tip that... Watch, now I can't do it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, basically, like I was saying before in the tabletop, that rim is so small that it can miss this extractor and fall below it. So I'm going to take this round out on the table so if i were to take this gun beyond the point say i was doing a reload chucked them out see how the extractor is sitting on top of my rounds that's a problem so to remedy this i have to come back hopefully you could hear that snap of the ratchet and then as i open the gun what i'm going to do is get right to the point where it's at its fullest extension oh. this is where it gets fun Let's turn it so I can get it. I'm just going to slip them past. Set those down, get them out of the way. And we're ready to go again. Not the end of the world. It's just kind of obnoxious because 45 Colt has a super small I rim. I have gotten rid of the screw up in my gun. All the rounds are fixed. I am now down to four blanks or four empties and one live round. So that on the buzzer, I'm going to draw, fire at that middle target open the gun up, reload it as fast as I can, come back up and make one shot and see what kind of time I get. That took me 17 seconds, which is plenty of time to kill me. Uh, still, that is a crap load faster than, just a second, this thing. So for giggles, what we're going to do now, set that gun aside. I'm going to show you how a single action army would load. Most people are totally familiar with this. I'm going to go ahead and load this up the same way if I can. Get one shot. There's my one. And then I'm going to grab some brass real quick. Okay, count it around. All right. So I should be good to do the exact same thing as long as I got some ammo close. We we're going to try that again, but now I'm going to do it with a Colt single action army without my handy dandy snap open reload. So same drill, draw, I should have my round clock to one shot, empty the gun, reload the gun, shoot one shot. Now, oh my gosh, 
I'll get a load one. Skip one so I can get my five and be safe. This is not fast. was faster than I thought it would be. That was 28 seconds and I have some hot breath. <laughs> so 2858, the Schofield done it in about 17. So I'll let you choose which one you think is faster. That's hopefully simple. But this gun does handle fairly well. So that's one thing at the time where with this firearm, the Schofield or the, uh, sorry, the number three, we had quite a bit of speed of reload we got a little bit of ungainly feel this gun the colt feels quite a bit better in hand but it's really difficult to argue with that reload and i didn't throw any shots really with the number three so kind of take that for what it is Shooting and everything is very cool and having the period correct firearm is awesome, but you also, if you at least want to be a big old nerd and cosplay-ish and all that stuff or do cowboy action, you need a rig. Um, so we're going to get this guy out all good. This rig was made up for me by J.M. Ross. Um, he has moved a lot of times, so I have no idea where he's located anymore, but he does have a website. Um, this was one of the cooler things that he ever did for me. We're going to lay it out and just kind of talk about it. So I called him up again because I'm a nerd and I'm into this older stuff and asked him specifically to make me a belt that would be appropriate for someone in like the 1870s, 1880s. So he got terribly excited. He does mostly competition gear and he said this is something that he's been wanting to do for a while. So that worked out really well because I had a belt and holster in three days. Now I don't want to tell anybody that that's his normal lead time. I think it was a little slower at the time. Uh, I looked on his website a few days ago and he's got like a six month lead. So if you think you're going to jump on and get a three day holster, sorry. But it's a cool story. So I explained that I want just kind of a rough, unlined, you know, what would someone at that time who didn't have a ton of money but wanted a decent holster do. So he set me up with his roughest piece of saddle skirting so that you can kind of see there's a little bit of roughness in this thing. Um, and he set me up with a period correct 1880s style holster with a Cheyenne style where this is all one piece of leather and he basically cuts a couple loops out of it and it actually just wraps around the belt and the holster tucks right down into its loops. Um, if you like holsters and things, you can kind of see this is almost like a Slim Jim style, but that's how they attach it to the belt. So it's fairly skinny. And one of the coolest things to me was that he actually used, he said his leather tools were from, I think he said like 1910, his grandfather had purchased them. This is something that's been in their family for a really long time. Um, so all the tooling is very old and original tooling, uh, very simple. Uh, if you didn't have a ton of money, you weren't going to do all the floral carving, things like that. But I thought it would be awesome to do kind of a shout out to him. Um, and I can't thank him enough for this. This is my favorite rig. And I've got a couple of competition rigs that have been made. And historically speaking, this is by far the coolest thing that I have. All right, so some final thoughts on the Cimarron number three, first model American. Uh, show and clear, and again, it's just really fun to open the thing. I would definitely say this is worth purchasing, but I am kind of a nerd for historical firearms and especially for old Western stuff. Uh, I like cowboy action shooting. I have 1870s tactical gear for God's sake. So you can tell this is kind of my thing. Um, if you're into more modern stuff, this probably won't tickle any buttons for you, but very cool historical piece as close as you can get to an original without dropping $4,000. Um, I would very much like to thank companies like Cimarron for bringing these kinds of pistols, uh, rifles, shotguns, uh, pretty much anything period correct that they bring to the market. It is really awesome 
to handle and fire modern replicas that feel and look just like the original. There are many other companies that do that kind of thing and thank you to all of those as well. Uh, also would very much like to thank again J.M. Ross for my holster. Uh, again, one of my favorite things that I own and it's just a chunk of leather. So he did an awesome job and it was really fun dealing with him and talking to him. I think we talked for at least an hour just about that holster and making it. So thank you again to him. Uh, and realistically, that's all I've got for you guys. We may do a follow-up video with the Cimarron Schofield, uh, which is the basically the next best thing to the number three. Kind of demonstrate a few of the changes. Won't be near as long a video, but just kind of something to look at. But lots of people have already seen that in movies, video game stuff. Thought it'd be neat to bring you something that's not really out there very often. But thank you again from Triple F Shooting, and I will see you guys next time. That took me 16 seconds, sorry. <laughs>